Welcome back to the Automate Construction Podcast. We're joined today by Tom Macroconis from Macro 3D in Australia. Tom, how are you doing today? Really good. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. What time is it over there? Uh, it is 7 a.m. bright and early on Saturday morning. All right, cool. It's 4 p.m. on Friday here uh, in Houston, Texas. And uh, you guys have been building you've been in the concrete printer business for since 2017 i saw with silk tech and then a separate company silk build in 2018 which is uh it says that's not one you're operating presently right now you're operating silk tech still and the new company macro 3d five months old uh maybe you can untangle that for me yeah for sure um so yeah five, as you said five years ago um i entered into concrete 3D printing and um, kind of trying to solve my own problem really. I'm only 24 um, at, at the moment and at the time I was only 19. I was looking at it going, how, how am I actually going to afford to, you know, buy a house in this market here in Australia? It's like, it's really expensive. I need fifty to $80,000 to try and purchase a house and that's just to put the deposit down. So I need, I need to do something. I need to find a way um, to try and make this more accessible to myself. And in, in doing that, hopefully do the same for others. Um, slick build was the first, I guess, um, first attempt that was working with, um, with another guy. Um, and anyway, we, we won't dig too deep into, into that. Um, but at the end of last year, we, um, we parted ways and, um, I went and started macro 3d, um, going in really uh, really trying to just provide the service of concrete 3D printing using um, the technology which I've designed and built um, and had done over the last number of years. Um, slick technologies, I guess, um, is the other part that you, uh, you brought up. That's actually a steel fabrication company. So it's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the company which helps keep the factory door open at the moment while we're still developing, still moving forward um, with our technology and, um, has given us a really good, I guess, foundation to be able to, um, enter into the, uh, concrete 3D printing space because we're actually in construction being, uh, steel fabricators. We're working with, um, structural steel and on top of that, it's, um, yeah, working with, I guess the other side of it being the, um, the, the machine fabrication as well. So it's, it's good. With, it's been a way that I can kind of um, blend a few things together um, to try and get the ultimate outcome, which was to enter into concrete 3D printing and um, try and make an impact in the construction industry that way. Yeah, so you do both concrete printing and metal buildings right now? Uh, yeah, we do. We do components of it. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you combine them? We are working on combining them, yeah. So um, it's obviously that I don't believe personally that there's one solution to building the perfect house, if you like, from a sure. from a structural point of view or um, from an aesthetic point of view. Like I, I believe timber, steel, concrete, they all can be blended together to make a really, really good structure. Um, and I think the, the, the underlying principle of your podcast being automating construction is actually um, really quite powerful because it's 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 less about concrete 3D printing and more about automating the industry itself because it is so slow, so archaic the way that we do things um, in construction and especially here in Australia, like a lot of our buildings are brick and timber frame, especially in Melbourne. Um, you go up, you go around Australia and we have slightly different versions of it um, like I know over in WA in Western Australia, they do a lot of um, what would be classed as double brick. So brick course inside, brick course outside. Insulation between. Um, yeah, correct. Correct. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's an interesting, interesting space that we're in at the moment um, here in Australia. So we are looking at trying to, to merge multiple disciplines, I guess, together being, uh, and different materials together, but it's it's really a case of we need to um, yeah just just work within what the uh, building code says and um, 
try and come up with a solution that's that's a, that's affordable. So when you start looking in the 3D printed construction industry to solve all the problems you're talking about, labor shortage, cost, uh, just Absolutely. in the pursuit of automation in general, uh, did you instantly know you would have to build your own printer or did you consider the uh, op, uh, available printers on the market? Uh, yeah, so the first two years of um, being in concrete 3D printing was all about let's just go and purchase a machine from overseas and bring it to Australia. Um, the biggest issue I faced is being a young person, you don't really have a lot of funds behind you. Um, so going and actually purchasing one of these machines was really, really difficult. Trying to raise money when people can't see, they can't touch and feel um, what, that, what that wall looks like. They can't quite wrap their head around how it works um, was actually one of the biggest sticking points. And then Obviously, we had that COVID nineteen thing come through, and um, that really put a put a big big stop on things um, for us. Like we obviously couldn't travel anywhere. Um, our lockdowns in Melbourne, um, especially, were very severe. Um, really, yeah, lock, locked up for a very long time, and so it was really difficult to actually move around. And thankfully, um, I could get down to a factory and and continue to to do some development. Um, and that's where we spun out into. Let's build our own machine. We can't manage to get access to anything um, <clears throat> that's like we were doing some work with RMIT at the time, and they had just purchased a side printer a CIB, from Cibay, mm -hmm. um, and so we were hopefully going to be working with that machine. But there was there was a there was a whole heap of issues with, due to COVID, and so we had to come up with with another way to be able to keep the dream alive, I guess, and so. It came to well, my background's in obviously fabrication. It's in um, it's in actually software. Really, um, I spent a lot of time in artificial intelligence and blockchain um, startups before that, um, where I was doing just a lot of advisory and a bit of um, bit of development work uh, with those sorts of people. And we taking the software side of things and coupling it with the mechanical side of things. It was like well, actually. I'm almost uniquely qualified to start working in this space. Let's 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 get some other people together who are much smarter than what I am, and let's try and make this um, let's try and make this possible. Sounds like one of the first people you brought on the team might be a materials expert. Sure was, yeah, sure was. So I've got now I've got a really 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 good um, materials expert. His name's um, Nicky Jackson. Um, he's based in New South Wales. Um, He's doing some really great work for us in uh, trying to reduce our carbon emissions um, mm. or our carbon content. Um, in our mixed design, we've got a couple of different options that we're working through to try and work out like what what is our optimal mix because obviously there's there's a number of different ways to approach this. Whether you have a one part mix, a two part mix, or that's wet or dry, you you got you got to work through all of all of that and try and work out well what's what's most cost effective what's logistically most possible um, for the different builds that that you're trying to go and do. Um, there's yeah, there's just another so big question is whether you're ways. buying a mix or making your own from scratch. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. So from our point of view, it was let's try and make this like with materials not being a background of mine, we need to obviously bring other people in to, to, to facilitate that. But in Australia, it was how can we, I guess, make it more accessible to more people? Let's let's not tie people into being stuck to our mixed design. Let's let, let, let's make it, let, let's try and um, open it up as, as best we can. So yeah, we've been, been working through just a few different mixed designs um, over the last few years. And um, we, we've got a couple of different options that we've, that we found worked and um, yeah, um, unfortunately with, with slick things didn't quite work out the way they were supposed to, but um, now with macro 3d, it's, it's been um, yeah, really exciting to go and try and make it happen um, all over again. So you decide you want to build a printer and then you have some other choices uh, gantry system or robotic arm system? How did you choose? Um, I am of the opinion that flexibility is key. Um, 
I have looked at the way that uh, all these gantry systems have been have been made, and just the the, the logistics of moving them around for us mm-hmm. um, was something that I I wasn't really comfortable with, I guess. Um, so that's why I moved towards the robotic arm systems, and uh, we've actually started developing a, a bit of a hybrid um, where we can kind of work move kind of between the two of them, um, still have the flexibility, but have the i guess usability of those gantry systems um and then the ability to print such a large footprint um but the 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 robotic arm system was really accessible to us as well because in in australia we used to have a lot of car manufacturing Um, we used to have holden and ford who manufactured cars here but we no longer have that industry so there was all of these surplus industrial robots just laying around and we found a supplier um, also based in, in New South Wales who could supply us with those um, and went and grabbed one of those, brought it down to Melbourne and tried to work out how to program it so it could um, so, so it could follow a toolpath. And then from there mm-hmm. we um, uh, spun out into putting it on tracks, trying to make it something that was um, usable on site so that we could start concrete 3D printing. A lot of customers want evidence that a printer can do what the manufacturer says it's capable of. So they say it can print a house. Where's the house? Uh, So you guys have started that process. Yeah, we've actually got a project that we will hopefully be able to share a bit more about um, in the next month or so. So, yeah, we've got a got a build, which is really exciting, Um, working with a with a with a client um, to try and get that. That completed and um i do totally agree with you one of the biggest things with us was we need to make sure we're actually out there doing what we're saying we can do so uh now that we've got uh, our new printer we've just just finished a, another machine that's uh, ready to go that's under the macro 3d banner this time um and we're able to go out and and start using that that new machine so made some improvements on the last one um which is which is exciting yeah, absolutely. And so going forward, after you get that proof of concept house, is your plan to sell printers or are you building more houses? Both? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we're we taking the position of where we want to provide the service of concrete 3D printing here in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, there's, uh, there's we're not going to say no to, to selling printers um, and to working with people in, in collaboration. Um, I think that's that's one of the key things is construction in Australia and, and globally is such a massive market. There's there's actually room for a lot of people in, in this space. You look at the number of people who are builders and who are quite successful in their own right. They um, there's, there's so many of them because the industry is so big. And I think the same thing will start to happen with concrete 3D printing is that the industry is so big, we have the opportunity to work together um and i know i know in australia we're actually we're quite a small industry there's 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 only a few companies kind of doing this but we all know each other fairly well and um we see each other at events and stuff like that like i was yeah with nick from um from contour uh two days ago at the rmit event um the international additive manufacturing forum um i'd say australia's got to be a top five market for 3d construction printers now moving forward moving forward we will be we will be um it, it's not being i guess utilized yet we're not actually out there building the volume of homes like the us like europe and stuff like that so it's definitely a key place where we've got the opportunity to we have a huge huge issue <clears throat> looking at like, you open the newspaper here in Australia at the moment um, and every every single day it's rental crisis it's construction mm-hmm. crisis it's builders going into liquidation it's supply issues it's labor shortages it's it, it's it's right for the it's it's the right right time it's the right opportunity um, for concrete 3d printing to really make a big impact in the industry and um, and, and prove its worth. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if uh, more younger people recognize the need to replace labor with technology and 
uh, if that's something that uh, you feel your peers are also interested in, or are they they think yeah, you're crazy? I, <laughs> uh, some of them think I'm crazy, um, but I, th I think it's actually it's, it's a really exciting opportunity. So obviously, there's a bit of a I don't know what it's like in the US, but in Australia, there there can sometimes be a bit of a, a stigma around apprenticeships versus university. Um, and so what I think 3D printing does and automating construction in general does is it really allows you to um, to bring together old school trade skills and couple it with these new STEM skills, STEM skills. And so by doing that, you're not only creating a new breed of job, but you're creating opportunities for the, for a new breed of worker. Like you, you've seen concrete three D printing before. You a lot a lot of it's sitting sitting around. Really, you you, you set the printer and off you go, and um, and it's doing the work. Which um, for for our generation, um, we're of the same generation. And it's um, <laughs> no one really wants to work that hard. So if you've got the ability to to sit there and let a machine do the work. All you've got to do is work off your computer. It's a, it's a, it's a really beautiful opportunity. That's the dream, but it does end up being a lot of hard work. <laughs> these prints. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, that's the thing that I think most people forget is it's, it sounds really good, but actually when you're on site and you're doing it, you're, you're constantly running around checking stuff and um, making sure like your levels are correct, making sure the material is coming out nicely. Do you have material in the machine, like in the in the pump itself? How's the machine? Yeah, there's operating? moments, like you said, where you can relax, snack on a bag of chips if everything's going well. But there's also moments where you're on the printer's time and it's not stopping <laughs> and you don't want to stop it. So it's not like the old guys who are used to saying, okay, I'm going to take a smoke break because I feel like it. Uh, they don't get that smoke break. They need to wait until they're on the printer's time now. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it is something that I guess we're looking to work on solutions for, um, and there's there's a few ways in which we're looking to do that. Whether it's whether just it's more through, automation, whether it's through automation, but also through the material science part of it as well. Um, like obviously, like everyone around the world, we're, we're focused on using mortars and using concretes to start with. But it's like, well, what does that actually turn into in the future? Is there any other ways that we can do this where you can just stop? Like, is there a way we can we can stop a print halfway through a wall, stop the printer, take our smoko break, and then come back and continue on from where we are, not have the issues around cold joints, not have the issues um, around lines setting hard and stuff like that. There's, there, I think there are ways to do it, um, and that's, I guess, what I've tasked Nikki with is try and work out a way to um, make that happen. Uh, and on top of that, we're obviously trying to do it from a robotics and, and automation point of view. So, yeah, it's a. It, okay, I keep coming back to it, but it's just it's just a really exciting time. Um, there's so so much going on. There's so many different ways to work with this technology um, that I think it's it's just it's really the right time for this to enter into the Australian construction market and, and make a big impact. Yeah, and there's no doubt that you're doing more real engineering than a lot of the kids that end up going to university and then are sitting at a computer doing Excel sheet stuff all day. Uh, sure, that's some kind of engineering too, but it's not the same as getting your hands covered in concrete. Uh, yeah. Is that what you did after you, the Australian high school equivalent? You uh, what did an apprenticeship? Uh, no, so I'm... My my story, I guess, to to give a bit of a a summary is my Please. so my dad's a motor mechanic. Um, he works has worked on cars for a number of years. Um, since mm -hmm. he, since he was eighteen, um, and I worked a little bit with him through high school. Um, high school wasn't I wasn't exactly the best student. Um, I yeah probably spent more time playing sport and doing other things than actually doing schoolwork. So. Going through high school, I'd go off and like I'd work with my dad, um, where I learned a lot of the mechanical skills. And then I got to year twelve and had a a, a sporting accident. I I, um, I broke my leg playing uh, Aussie rules, playing uh, playing footy, uh, as we would call it here in Australia. And during that process of recovery, I like my mum 
<laughs> my mum refers to it as Tom learned to read in this period. Um, and so I started to do uh, a lot more, a lot more reading, a lot of research and, and, and learned to program in that time. And so that period of having to learn to program <clears throat> led to uh, my first job at the business consultancy. And that, uh, that, that job there was all around new technology. I'd, I'd become really fascinated through the learning to program, became really fascinated in blockchain technology and the implementation of that. So being involved with new technology, I guess, has been something I've done for a, a fair while now. Um, Your dad yeah. was a mechanic. That's a valuable piece of information. I guess that's why you had the hardware confidence going forward with the machine that you built. Um, but what did the blockchain bring in to, are you using anything that you learned from the blockchain job now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so from my dad being a mechanic um, and spending the time uh, understanding, I guess, the mechanical side of things, we then moved into, well, moving into the software space, <clears throat> it was picking up useful pieces. Um, you, it's, it was picking up useful skills that were a requirement for going and building automated systems. So with, with blockchain, obviously it was a, it was a brand new technology. And so mm -hmm. very similar to 3D printing. Although when you actually dig into the history of 3D printing, it was back in, was it 1960 or 1970? Around that time was when the patent for concrete 3D printing was produced. Is that, is that correct? I don't know which patent. There's a bunch of different, uh, there's a William Herschel concrete machine, but that, is tamping. Some people say it's not really printing because there's no G code yeah. file. I don't know. Semantics. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Semantics. You're still placing concrete in, um, in, in an innovative way, but nevertheless, the, the, the journey that I kind of went on was I started working for my dad, worked out how to program after, after an injury. And from there went into the business consultancy role where I was, I was looking at new technology. I was reviewing new technology all the time writing papers on the technology and, and, and found that actually concrete 3D printing was not being done in Australia. Um, and it was about that time I was looking at it from looking at entering into the housing market. And that's where I found the struggle of, I need all of this money to try and buy a house. Let's find another way to do it. And so coupling the mechanics side of things, coupling, coupling the software side of things, it's, yeah, allowed me to, um, and allowed me to go in and understand the robotics side of things and, um, have, have the two perspectives, have the ability to mechanically understand the machine software, understand the software. And then through the period of developing the machinery, I was actually out on site working, um, and laboring for different, different builders, um, and the likes. So how did you get the first client to trust you to use the printer that you built yourself to <laughs> print something in concrete? Um, yeah, it was, it's a very, very interesting question. Um, he himself is very excited about concrete 3d printing and, um, he, he was going to work with, with us, um, at, at, at slick build, but, um, yeah, decided that working with, with me at macro 3d um, would be an exciting opportunity. And so together we've put together, um, a bit of a plan as to how we think we can take it from just being sitting in my factory to actually operating full time on the construction market. Um, he, he is a big believer in the technology, um, himself. So he kind of has already sold himself on, on using that technology. Um, which is, which is really, really helpful. And then f you almost need that, um, you need that backing so that moving forward, you can, you can, yeah, really be, really be backed well. Yeah. It's easy. Once you have a house built, someone else can say, how much is it? I want one too. Uh, but that first one takes a lot. It's, it's a little good. bit of a leap of faith. Very much so. Very much so. That being said, I'm sure you're dedicated. So if something were to go wrong, you'd repair it, replace it. It has your full undivided attention. Yeah, that's correct. So that was also one of the reasons going back to one of your other questions, why we were focused on, on it being mobile. So there's obviously strategies for dealing with, with failures through, um, through the print and uh, 
obviously you're not trying to have print failures, but naturally they're going to happen. So by printing single wall panels, it enables us to have that redundancy in our build process. The wall falls over, no worries, Just scrape it up, move on, reprint it. And similarly, when it comes to the house being existing for a period of time, stuff happens to your house. A car can be driving down the road, comes and smashes into the corner of the house. We need, rather than, re, like, how, how would that be managed with one of these monolithic structures? Well, it's, it's a little bit of overkill to go and bring a whole gantry system to go and print that little section. Instead, having these mobile systems enables us to come in and just reprint that section for you if there is an issue, if there's an extension wanting to be done. It, it, it allows for a more modular um, a, a more modular process moving forward. So it's not just thinking about new homes, it's thinking about, well, what is the life cycle of a house? Well, life cycle of a house is it gets developed and redeveloped over the years. And what does your print team look like? Uh, at this stage, we're very, very lean. So most of our team is um, is, is either contracted uh, to come in and, and do little bits and pieces. Um, we are currently going through a capital raise at the moment to try and, uh, I guess, escalate our, our business and make it a, a, a much more substantial company than, than just a couple of people who um, a lot of my team work within the steel fabrication side of things. Um, so they're, they're welders and, um, and fabricators who come in and, and give us a hand when we need to. Um, until we get to that point where we've got the got the capital, I guess, to bring on more people. Sure. I meant more to the printer that you developed to operate it. Um, how many people are required and what are their kind of roles or responsibilities? Sure. So we typically, we can run the machine using uh, using only three people. Um, mm -hmm. You can get away with two, but it's obviously a bit easier with three. You've got one person looking after the robot. Um, they are focused on making sure the, the print programs are all loaded onto the robot um, and making sure we're running the right program at the right time in the right location on the build. Because obviously we have to map out, um, you, you, you need to have the, the plans laid out with the different programs that are going to be run for each section of wall that's being printed. So that's one person's role. The second person's role is focused on the material. And then the third person we've been using as like a bit of a conduit between the two. So where, so where the robot guy needs a little bit of extra help for whatever reason, he can go and do that work. And similarly, on the material side of things, some, something needs to be collected, moved, um, lifted. You use that other person for that role as well. Speaking of lifting, what's the material loading process like? Uh, at the moment, we're using... Um, we're using, um, we're actually shoveling it in. Um, so we're mm -hmm. like dry, using a bit of a dry mix and that, that dry mix is then being shoveled into our, um, into our M-Tech pump and uh, pumped out through that. The pump that you're using, did you go through a lot of uh, trial and error? Did you buy a pump off the shelf or develop one? Uh, yeah, so we, we bought an M-Tech. Um, mm -hmm. It was... <laughs> It was largely about what we could afford, um, to be honest, and what was available um, sure. in, in Australia. It's a, it's a little bit more difficult to get a hold of these these pumps. Um, I know uh, Contoured has had, and I'm not going to try and steal any of their thunder. I think having Nick on the podcast would be, be a great opportunity as well um, for them. But uh, I think I did a podcast with Contour. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um up here, so they they've obviously got their their May pump right. Um, so working with working with the May pump, um, we would like to move to the May pump at some stage. Um, it's just largely a cost thing for us. So the so the um, the the decision of what pump we're going to use, like we actually started uh, at Slick using a, a Putzmeister, a Putzmeister. Uh, SP11, which is a hydraulic, uh, hydraulically driven pump, and found out very, very quickly that hydraulically driven pumps are not very suitable to concrete 3D printing because you end up having issues around um, constant flow rates. So as the hydraulic fluid warms up, it obviously changes um, 
and you're constantly changing the load on the motor because you're uh, putting new material in or, um, yeah, you, it just the hydraulic pump was just really not working very well for us. We were constantly adjusting um, our speeds. We weren't able to get a consistent speed, and so we, you'd have um, like pulsations through the through the machine as well. So our our decision to go to the to the M Tech was largely because it's been used, it's proven. A um, number of other companies around the world use this particular pump. So if we can make some more modifications to it, add some more sensors and stuff like that, and plug that into the um, the artificial intelligence model we're training at the moment we can try and capture all this data and have the AI compute the data for us on, on our side. Yeah, cool. The data capture, I guess, is a, a big critical step and it's a little bit painstaking just because you have to do just hours and thousands of print hours. It is, it is, it is. It's, um, yeah, tra training models is not, not an easy thing. It's not an easy feat, but yeah, it's it's all about just printing more and more and more and trying to capture as much of that data as we can and try and find um, papers and stuff like that. Like one of the, I guess, interesting things about artificial intelligence is that with your with large language models like what ChatGPT is, you can synthesize large swaths of data. So you can take papers for example that are written on the material science and try and work out like from that what is the best version of a of a mixed design from those papers um, it becomes a really really powerful tool to help fast track a lot of your a lot of the development and that's that's also where we're trying to utilize it too it's not just in the print process it's actually in the development process how can we how can we fast track things by um taking large uh, large data sets and then working out what is it that we actually want from those data sets and trying to ask the best question possible. Yeah, that's such a simple use case that anyone could do for papers in any subject and just kind of exactly. supercharge your ability to get the important information out. Uh, and I think it's something that does not come natural to older people. Uh, there are still people where it doesn't come natural to use a computer and they're saying, print that out for me so I don't need to read it in my email. Um, but everything's moving <laughs> so quickly like now. <laughs> it's going to be so crazy to have a whole generation of people enabled by ChatGPT where it's their instinct to be time efficient that way. Yeah, it's so, like it's super exciting. Like being able to sit there and like try and even like little things like writing an email. Like you don't need to sit down and write out the entire email anymore. You just bash out some some key points and let it generate it for you, so it sounds business like. So it's um yeah it's 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 really really been really really helpful for us. And from a programming point of view, like it's we're we're taking we've worked out a way that we can increase our the code output that we can actually produce um, because it can help to not only debug parts of our code, but it's also um, ways in which we can write generalized functions really, really quickly. Um, maybe getting a little bit technical for um, for us, but yeah, it's, it's something that we're, we're working on is how we actually implement this technology, not just in the printing process, but into the business itself, because it's just, it's so powerful. Um, and it's, it's just going to touch so many different industries in so many different ways. And can change change a lot of things it's a big inflection point for us yeah certainly was the uh you had worked on a different type of ai in the past was that a gpt or a different realm um it was very early on in uh i guess machine learning it was very focused on um on predictions more than anything so neural nets um yeah neural networks it was it was an interesting project that we were working on. Um, didn't really have the success that we were hoping for, um, and we ended up shutting it down because it just did. It, it, artificial intelligence systems have uh, obviously a bit of a mind of their own, and so mm -hmm. if it starts going down a certain track, you have to you have to just stop. Kill it so, before it destroys the earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Terminator style. Yeah. So, yeah, what was but, the goal with that? AI you were developing? 
Um, the goal with that with that system originally, um, look, it was it it was actually a um, it was a bit of a trial process. So what what we were looking to do with it is is take it into the blockchain space. So how can we develop some sort of hybrid between the two, um, where you can manage the the consensus of the <clears throat> The consensus of the, um, the the blockchain network through these artificial intelligence um, systems and, and look, it, I'll be honest, I've probably forgotten a lot of it because it's been um, it's been a few years and the the, the actual the the detail of it um, I've just been so consumed with what we're doing with with concrete. Yeah, more or less, from my understanding, it's like each node has a collection of all the transactions and account balances and for these nodes are stored in different ways but an artificial intelligence could maybe reduce the computing power required to access and validate that node thereby reducing the energy and upkeep expense or something like that yeah it was also looking at the, it, was, it was looking at the you have so in a blockchain system, depending on which one you're looking at, there's obviously different protocols and different ways in which these blockchain systems can be utilized. And it's actually something that I think concrete 3D printing will implement at some stage as some sort of blockchain system. We, we'll come, we can probably come back to that. Um, yeah. But we were looking at it from, a, from like a governance point of view. So how can you have a properly distributed um, blockchain system? And the answer to that was that people are removed from that situation. At least that was the that was the hypothesis. Um, you end up getting into a point where you're reliant way too much on the technology, um, and that becomes dangerous. So we sat there and went, well, maybe maybe this isn't the right way to do it. Let's let's review other ways to go about it. And so that's what we ended up doing. We took it in a different direction. Um, so that the experience from working with the artificial intelligence um was exciting and was really really um i guess helpful moving for, for moving forward and i'm a believer of everything happens for a reason so um yeah w working with that enabled me to be where i am today um but moving forward yeah it's it, for us ai is is actually more of a tool than anything else um if we can it sounds like you're a guy who it. appreciates decentralization Yes, yes, I, I, I do, I do appreciate it. Yes, there's, there's ways in which it can be done, um, and I think we've just got to be careful about how we, how, how we go about doing it. Yeah, it's tricky. A lot of these technologies, with the goal of decentralization, it can be a fine line between then becoming ultra centralized, where all of a sudden the tech gives them more control or more power or some weird. Uh, yeah, it was, it's kind of funny with what's happened with, with the blockchain industry. Like, we, it started off and it was supposed to be all about decentralization. And then we ended up having centralized exchanges where that was the only place you could trade the cryptocurrencies. It's like, well, it's not, that's not really what it was designed to do. Um, and I think we've actually got to change the narrative on blockchain away from cryptocurrency. It needs to be focused on distributed ledger technology it's it's actually the, the underlying technology is what is key and like for, for construction um it's something that we're definitely working towards um it's on the roadmap of things to work on um obviously step one get get house number one built and um really cement ourselves pardon the pun but cement ourselves in, in the industry as, as someone who is who is doing the work but moving forward keeping an eye on the future it's how do we implement these new technologies, which are key um, to the success of um, uh, of of us in the industry? It's yeah, it's it's focusing on how can we work with how can we take like a blockchain technology and implement that into concrete three D printing? How do we look at it from um, a u from a um, a, a printing point of view, but how do we look at it from an end user point of view? Where's where's the connect that we can we can actually add value using this technology? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about it very abstractly, and I don't have somewhere concrete that I'm going with this, but the connection seems to be 
the decentralization in that the construction industry is historically decentralized. You have lots of smaller construction companies, family owned construction companies globally uh, mm. in different codes. And blockchain also optimizes decentralization because if you're not going to be a centralized block, if you're going to be centralized, you may as well just be an Excel spreadsheet because the data is all in one place. Yeah, you're a data silo in that in that case. Yeah, I think I think one of the one of the really cool things is obviously there's the um, there's the, the the decentralization part of it, but there also becomes a way that we can share ownership as well. So one of the things that we've played with is what if you what if for every meter of of print that actually becomes worth something how can you how can you tokenize an entire print like that that becomes a really interesting thought exercise of well if we can do that what does that mean for the build like who owns what part of the build how do we if we're also capturing the data we know what's happened with that one meter of print that's happened we know what the environmental uh what, what the what the environmental sensors picked up we know what the humidity the temperature was at the time we know what the material was doing at that time we know the water that was delivered to that material at that time and we know the print speed that we're operating at like it becomes a it becomes a really interesting thought exercise as to what that becomes what what the value is that can derive from that like is it some sort of extra market that comes to the property industry is it a way that like insurers and regulators can really nail down what's happening in the build to make sure it's built properly. Um, yeah, it becomes a it becomes a really really interesting thing to start to look at if we can immutably store this data at the same time. That would be super valuable to municipalities, government organizations, uh, especially because they try to do these projects and then they end up going double, triple over budget. But if they were able to pay in advance for a specific number of meters and be guaranteed that they get that many print meters, uh, that's a very compelling product. Yeah, it is. It is. It's 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 very very interesting to start to start to look at and look. It's definitely going to take more than just a few people to to try and crack that case. But yeah, I think it's it's something that needs to be done, um, and we're we're putting in time for it and. Let's yeah. Hopefully, we'll start to print, show show some fruits for our labor and um, go from there. Yeah, I think it's just a little glimpse into a whole future, a, a whole new realm of possibility that technology enables in terms of the data collection. It's no longer a person with a camera or a tablet that has to walk around the site and put everything in by hand. It's uh, all. I mean, at some point, maybe even an AI determines the best sensor to get, orders it on Amazon, <laughs> some other robotic arm installs yeah. it on the system. Uh, we're a ways off absolutely, from there, absolutely. but can't wait to do yeah, that video. Well, absolutely, that, that, that'd be really exciting. Well, you even look at the way that um, a lot of the cameras now are mounted on the machine um, and the, the defect detection that can go on through computer vision. Like that's, that's just as powerful because now that you've got that ability to, to capture that data, we can now make sure that the print that's coming out is what we say it is. Um, you can capture the entire build process end to end. You can make sure that it can pick up so that the, the computer vision is able to pick up stuff that we're missing. And that's even more powerful. So you, you're getting a better product out of automating the construction industry. What more are you able to say about the capital raise? Um, we'd love for someone to, to put the money on us um, to be able to um, continue moving forward. Like we're doing a lot of obviously exciting things and there's there's a big roadmap of things, but it's a very clear pro, uh, it's a very clear process that we have laid out. It's focused on let's make sure we're building. Um, let's we've got a number of contracts which are lined up and it's just a matter of do the first build and then execute on those contracts. Um, but the key thing for us is, yeah, we, we, we just need to get that money in so we can continue moving forward at the speed of which we know we need to be, we need to be running at. So if someone's if listening I, and they want to invest, how do they reach out? Uh, please reach out either via the website or um, I'm happy to share my, uh, share an email address with you. It's info, yeah, sure. at, info at macro3d.com.au. Um, we're open to not just Australian-based investors, but yeah, 
US or Europe, wherever, wherever really. Um, happy to work with people, but yeah, it's it's a really exciting time for us to um, move forward. Have you considered crowdfunding? Um, we did look at crowdfunding. It was it was an option for us, but I'm not. I'm I'm definitely not against it. Um, I think though for the for the business, I would, uh, uh, my, my thoughts are that for the business, we focus on an actual straight capital investment. And then potentially we start to look at different ways we can use crowdfunding for larger projects. Like you look at what Icon's gone and done um, over in the US with, uh, with, their, with their 100 homes build. Mm -hmm. um, something like that becomes really interesting where we can start to crowdfund almost the entire, the entire community, if you like. Um, and by crowdfunding that, you can then couple that back with the blockchain technology and you almost are able to easily deliver um, ownership of parts of these builds to the people who have put the money in. One dollar is one linear meter or something like that. You, you, you start you start to, um, yeah, it's what I came back to with. It, it's a really ex, it's a really interesting opportunity to really explore why different ways where we can start to fund things once we um, once we implement some of this technology. So, yeah. So you raised a couple yeah. million. I hope so. <laughs> and then what? And then we then we execute on our contracts. So we get into building. We start building. We move it. At, we move at the pace that we we want to be moving at. So it's service providing. It's developing more machinery. Um, it's innovating on that machinery as well. And what are those first key hires you'll make with the uh, war chest? Um, we need to bring in another another software engineer. Uh, we need to bring in uh, some more printer operators so that it's not just me and a couple of other guys operating. Um, we need to bring in some construction guys. Uh, the, the key thing for us at the moment is obviously – we're a little bit light on in the construction department. Like obviously I've spent some time in the industry, but we need, we need builders um, who are really um, willing to work alongside us and, um, and take a big role. So we're looking for like a head of operations, I guess, for, for the construction side of things. <clears throat> um, and yeah, our material side of things is pretty much taken care of through Nikki. He's, he's, been, been amazing um, with the stuff he's been able to develop <clears throat> um, just on his own. Um, but covering off on, yeah, the, the construction side of things, so having someone in construction, having someone in who's um, focused around the, the operation of these machines and the guys who are developing the machinery, so your, your, your general fabricators, your, uh, your electronics guys, your mechatronics guys, your, your software guys. That's they're kind of I guess the areas in which we will look to hire um, moving forward, and it's obviously a, a bit of a slower build because we're focused on yeah delivering delivering the service. So most of our work will be done with those people who are uh, operators of these machines. So the project you have underway, I know there's not much you can share about that yet, but will yeah. is that a permitted building? Uh, this one won't be um, just because we're trying to get it done. So it's better that way. That way, you know you can get it done. You don't have to rely on somebody else. Yeah, correct. And it's also a way for us to test a number of different things. Like our engineers that we work with um, here in Melbourne, we have a number of performance solutions that we want to. So for for building here in Australia, um, the ways that we've worked through the building code is obviously to build two performance solutions because there's obviously there's no building code yet for it. Um, even though I know there's some work being done. Um, there's, the, there's, there's a whole committee working towards getting some, there's a draft actually out at the moment, um, for some, yeah, those some, are some standards, standards just for the process, defining the mm -hmm. process. They haven't started for the standards on structural printed concrete yet, unfortunately. Yeah, correct. And so that becomes a very, I, I think we've, we've got, we've got plenty of different ways in which we can actually build the structure. Um, like whether it's through steel, through columns, like we've seen a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and so working with our engineers, it's about having those structural performance solutions coupled with 
um, obviously the the general material solutions that we're we're trying to work towards. So if we've got all of these different elements in which we can test with this build, then it means the engineers are satisfied. We can have those building surveyors come out and look at it. But coming back to the touch and feel of the build, people need to see it before they'll really believe it. Um, it's it's almost like a build it and they will come is really what this this build is. Uh, it's it's focused on test what we know or what we're thinking, test the hypothesis. It's a very scientific way, I guess, to put it, is test the hypothesis, make sure we know that these are ways in which we can do it and then try and get building permits off the back of that because it's like, here's the build that's done. Here's the performance solution. Here's the data that we captured during the build. Um, now, what's what's your other reasons that we, or what's the other reasons that we, um, we need to make some changes to this or what's the uh, what's the other solutions that you think should be used mr engineer yeah man it seems like you have uh, all the right goals yeah I, I hope so anyway i hope so it's um i'm just i'm, I'm just so, so excited that we're we're finally making some some big steps forward and um i'm excited for what i guess the next 12 months holds for macro 3d um, I'm working with uh, Steve Samatino. Um, he's actually uh, my business partner, and um, some of the. For those who don't know, he's um, he's a he writes and thinks about technology. Um, he's been um, what would be defined as a like a, almost like a futurist, I guess. He 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 writes a lot about these new technologies. So having him on board has allowed me to, I guess, explore other avenues. So it's what what is it that is being done in say the medical industry or what's being done in in mining what's being done in all these other industries from a technology point of view and can that be actually brought into construction and what we're doing is it's just being able to have that um that extra perspective has been been really refreshing as well so yeah it's it's an exciting next 12 months it's a lot of work that we've got to get through we've got to We've got to prove ourselves now. We're, we're saying a lot. It's now time to, to actually execute. Would you say Stephen serves kind of a mentorship role for you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How did that come to be? Um, it was interesting. So back when I was trying to develop, uh, trying to bring the um, Sibe machine over, I he'd put up a post on, I think it was LinkedIn, and he said, look, is anyone out there in Australia doing concrete 3D printing? I want to print a house. Very and cool. I sat there as a 20 year old, typed out a little response and was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it. Let's meet. And anyway, I went and met with him and it was like, oh, I'm thinking I might get this machine over here. It might, it might be exciting to do, do something together. And he's like, yeah, look, if you manage to do it, let me know. Um, two years passes, COVID happens and, I reach out to him again and say, look, I've, I've actually built this machine. Would you be interested in coming out and, and seeing it? And he goes, Ab absolutely. So he came out and originally we we're going to just do a build for him. And um, yeah, it ended up being that he was more and more interested. He'd, he'd been looking at the technology um, to bring it to Australia as well. So it, it was a good fit for us. Yeah, that's a cool role. I feel like now as the internet has kind of become more popular, it's hard to be like a general futurist now. Like I've picked a really tiny niche of construction automation and even smaller, just pretty much 3D printed concrete. Um, and it's taken a while. I mean, I tried to do a couple of videos at SpaceX. They have some different yeah. types of construction there, but I said like two things about a rocket ship and the comments ripped me apart because I don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> when it comes to rocket ships. It took me years to be able to talk like a little bit, I know what I'm talking about with 3D printed concrete. So it's hard. Like if this guy's Steven's talking about mining and all different industries, like you really have to know a lot of stuff to balance that much uh, diverse kind of technology and stuff. Yeah, he's a he's a smart guy. He's um he, he's got an economics background, so it's largely speaking around what is the he stays within his lane in that in that sense in that sure. he speaks about what it is that's um that he knows. So it makes sense. You'd have something to anchor it all together. Correct. Correct. It's, 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 it's the story around it, which is really key. And so does he like, maybe this isn't something you discuss with him often, but 
Keynesian economics or uh, the other one, Austrian economics? Uh, it's, I'll be honest, it's not really something we speak about that much. I'm sure he has a strong opinion on it one way or the other. It's a classic uh, economist debate, I guess, of kind of Eastern versus Western banking, but it's not something I know so much about. I think I might have pronounced it wrong too, but anyway. Uh, he's, he's someone you could probably even have on the podcast as well, because he can cover off on a, on a large swath of different technologies. Um, he's a very, very interesting guy to have, uh, have speak. Yeah. So you met just from a LinkedIn post. That's great. I met a lot of people yeah. that I did podcasts with on LinkedIn too. It's great. That's, that's how, how, how we're both sitting here. So, yeah, it really is. Uh, they're powerful. It's a great platform. Social media. When I was first breaking into the industry, a lot of people, it was hard to get responses from people. Um, and so I would just go on LinkedIn and I added everybody from every company that I could. And so if the first 10 people ignore you, but then one intern says yes, and then you get that mutual connection, all of a sudden you got the vice president and then the CEO is your connection. And then uh, <laughs> it's hacky, it's but it good. works, you know, whatever gets the results. <laughs> exactly. Well, you it it it's kind of one of the things for us is that like it how, how old are you by the way i am 26. yeah so we're, we're as as i said earlier we're, we are of the same i guess vintage if you like um if, if you can't even call it a vintage like we're we're really still quite young so to try and get access to the people that we need to be speaking to construction is such an old industry um and move, moving into like sitting in the, those rooms can be quite intimidating for us because we are, we, we just don't have the experience that a lot of these people have. And so trying to get those mutual connections is really being key because it's, it's the way you get into those rooms and um, get people to start listening to what you think is the, is the right approach for solving the big problem. Yeah. I mean, after you, build a printer, print a house, they got to look at you like you're on the same level. There's no age doesn't matter Absolutely. at that point. You did the thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Actions speak louder than words. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people who I talk to guys in their seventies, eighties, they call me and they say they're going to print a house. Maybe not that old sixties, but they <laughs> talk about all the things they're going to do. Uh, and then I reach out to them six months later, they don't even respond. Uh, some of these people even bought a printer and then returned it. They don't want to respond because it's such a headache. There's a lawsuit, but it's great to, I mean, you didn't even, we didn't get in touch until you had already built your printer and made all this progress, uh, working in silence, not trying to, I guess, toot the horns too early and celebrate too early. You're not one of these companies saying $10,000 printed house. So I, it seems like you're doing everything the right way. You got the mechanical foundations, you got the software foundations, you got the materials guy on board, uh, futures yours yeah man. yeah thank you we've, we've been focusing on doing it as a collective rather than trying to do it as one person um we you, you need you need lots of people to make this possible you need lots of people to believe in what we're doing and um it's it, I, I mentioned earlier it's such a big industry that we just we, we can work together on this and we should work together on this there's there's enough in it for everyone um to benefit yeah. What other places you mentioned your website? Do you have social media accounts people can follow you guys? You're active. Yeah. So we just act at macro 3d, um, on, on, um, on Instagram and, um, on LinkedIn, they're kind of our two main platforms. We stick with <clears throat> Instagram and LinkedIn mainly, um, obviously website, www.macro3d.com.au, um, is where you can find a bit more information and, uh, always happy to sit down and, and have a chat. Um, either over Zoom or if you're in Australia in person, um, happy to have people come out and, and look at what we're doing. Um, yeah, it's it's an exciting time for us. And so happy to share, happy to provide information where needed. Yeah, well, I guess primarily investors you're looking for, but also maybe potential employees, people that want to print houses in Australia, buy printers. All, all of the above, all of the above. Ha happy to happy to work with, with people and, um, yeah, just really excited for what's what's coming in the next couple of months. 
is there anything you need from another group maybe that also shares the mentality that everybody should work together like software slicers uh any kind of anything else that an open call for assistance um i think at the moment one of the key things for us um is really around well how can we how can we come up with ways to get this through regulations so it's actually like we need the the call to action i guess here is we want to work with the government regulators to to try and get this to be something that's not so scary at the end of the day all, all we're doing is placing concrete like we're not really reinventing the wheel that much it's free form construction it's not it's if we if you take 3d printing out of it it becomes a lot less scary doesn't it like you you, you turn around and say it's just free form construction guys we're, we're just building with no form work it becomes a lot less scary so sitting down with these regulators and and speaking to them about well it, it's not scary we can do it and then once we've built ours it's like here's the proof like we've already got houses up here in Australia um, thanks to contoured um, but we've got got the opportunity now to um, to work with these people um, so it's, it's yeah the big call to action is largely around we, we need to work together on regulation um, and from a from a technology point of view I think that's kind of taken care of itself um, there obviously in in software there's big big movement towards um, or there was over the last probably 10 15 years around open source software so you can pretty much find anything to do with robotics through open source software and now with chat gpt as well you can write a lot of it yourself so um i think it's just a case of you need to sit down and come up with those prompts um collaboratively i'm happy to work with people um whether it's on software whether it's on robotics systems whether it's on materials like I don't think we need to really focus too much on what our, our goal is not to be like a large material provider. If you like, we're happy to, if someone's got a better material, it's more cost effective. It's got a better, uh, better carbon footprint, like happy to use it. So yeah, happy to work with people on, on, on whatever aspect of concrete 3d printing, um, they want to reach out and discuss. Yeah. It seems like, from what I've seen, most new locations need some fine tuning with the materials. A lot of people are after like a one size fits all material, but it's very elusive. Yeah, well, from a uh, from a materials point of view, if you even in Australia, like we have to do different testing for different regions. So, <clears throat> if we've got a build in South Australia, um, then we have to go and get that particular sand tested. Like we we need to know how that sand going to react with our binder component um, or with our other other liquid additives that we might be using. Um, and similarly, in different parts of Victoria, we have different sand. So it's like you, you need to um, continuously test all these different components. And if you start adding gravel in there or rock, because um, you're starting to print with, with, with actual concrete, not just mortar, um, you've then got another component you've got to test on top of that. And so it's just constantly testing these materials based on the location that you're printing. So, yeah, that's if we can work out better ways to do that, I think it's 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 something that we need to still continue to develop. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Is there anything exciting or uh, that you'd like to talk about that we missed? Um. Anything at all? I guess anything at all. Um, I guess um, just having a bit of a flick through um, some things that are, I guess, key from our point of view um, that we, we try to speak about as much as possible. And I guess one yeah, of the sure. other things that one of the other things that we often speak about. Um, is the idea of uh, biomimicry. So what I mean by that is copying what's done in nature. So obviously 3D printing is very, very, um, it, it relates really quite well to biomimicry because we're building layer upon layer. We're constantly 
you literally you sit there and you watch the time lapses and stuff growing out of the ground. Um, but I think from a material science point of view, from a um, from an actual assembly point of view of our of our building structures, it's looking at how can we how can we start to 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 copy nature um, a, a lot more. How can we look at ways in which we can um, – yeah, again, sorry, man. I've lost my train of thought on that one. No, that makes a lot of um, sense, like the way uh, bees might insulate their hive or promote good airflow so that they get insulation but also ventilation or the way ants might create different structures or uh, the way a wasp might gather mud to place something exactly. or – anything biomimicry is a fascinating subject because nature has been evolving for so many millions of years to figure out the most perfect solutions. Why come up with our own from scratch when we could just copy their homework? That's exactly it. It's exactly it. It's there's obviously a lot more people who are more qualified around this, this whole area of coupling biology with material science. Um, I think that is actually a really, really exciting part of what we're what we're coming up with. Like we can already three D print in three hundred different materials. Granted, mm -hmm. not all are, um, are like an FDM style, but we we need to look at ways that we can try and utilize more more composite materials to come up with better solutions to our to our issues at the moment in the in the construction industry specifically. Um, it's yeah. Or the way a spider spins silk. If we could copy that on a printer, that'd be something. Well, yeah, you you look at the the strength properties that comes from it. Like, so the fact that spider's web can actually exist is is very very interesting. The origin story for Spider Man, all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's there's there's obviously. It's a very exciting time for our, for the industry. It's an exciting time for concrete three D printing. Um, we're finally. Uh, I don't know. I guess what 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 are your thoughts on that? But um, I feel like we're at a really key point um, where we're starting to see the fruits of what a lot of these companies have done for the last five to, I guess, ten years. We're not quite at ten years yet, but yeah, it's 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 approaching ten years really quickly where it's been. Um, development and now we're starting to see real projects being done um, and starting to get that, I guess, information that people have been asking for. Like, what is the ac the actual cost benefit? Not just what we think the cost benefit is from a square meter rate. It's what is the total benefit over a period of time? What is the the logistical benefit? What is all of the other benefits that come from 3D printing? That we've yeah, I would say that's the real fruit, the cost benefit. And I haven't seen the fruit yet. Uh, I hear it's coming and I can't wait yeah. to taste it. But yeah. uh, I've only heard the rumor so far. I haven't seen compelling uh, completed cost sheets, um, unfortunately. And it's something companies are very loud about their estimates before the project and after the project. All of a sudden, they don't want to talk about numbers anymore. And I've seen this story play out a hundred times. Uh, they all t say that they want to share transparent numbers in advance, and then after the project's complete, it's not the same. But yeah, the tree is growing. And I think when if it's the automation tree, there's no doubt there's going to be fruit one day. Uh, the 3D printed concrete tree, it's promising. Who knows? But whether or not that works out, It'll be the companies that learned how to implement software and technologies on the job site that are going to capture the automation gains in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's not just about three D printing; it's about automation in general. Yeah, for sure, and I think that's something I have a lot of confidence in, um, and that's one of the only things that I have, uh, I guess, belief towards in that, like. I try only to present things that happened. Like I love talking to you because you built the printer, you're printing concrete. I would never have someone on the podcast before they got to that step uh, because it's about what's concrete, what's occurred, what's happened. Uh, yeah. And it's always awesome having a primary source like you on the podcast to share this story. I really appreciate it, man. Uh, not a problem. I appreciate you having me on here.
yeah, I think it'll be a helpful thing too for people who want to get involved in the industry, uh, maybe other young people who think that because they're in 18 or 19, they can't do it, but that's not the case. They have advantages that the old guys don't really have. Uh, yeah, you, you actually uniquely qualified for the, for the problem. Like we're the ones who have to live in these houses. So like at the end of the day, if you, if you've got a, a drive to go and do something, you need to go and do it. Um, it was something I learned very early on. You, there's no problem that can't be solved. You just need to spend some time thinking about it. Yeah, great. Well, this was a great introductory podcast for Macro 3D on the Automate Construction podcast. And hopefully we get you on many times more in the future as you guys continue to automate construction. Absolutely. Look forward to sharing more um, with what's coming in the next few months. And thanks for having me, Jared. Appreciate it.